Hello and welcome to Views on News. I am Jawad Hami. In today's program, we are going to talk about the likelihood of the approval by the International Monetary Fund's Executive Board of a tranche after the first review after the IMF reached with Pakistani authorities the staff-level agreement as Pakistani authorities and the International Monetary Fund are in a standby arrangement that was earlier reached back in 2023. Uh, uh, now, after the approval of the Executive Board of the IMF, a uh, $700 million tranche would be released. Uh, that is, of course, uh, uh, after this particular Executive Board's approval. Now, that is going to be, uh, the meeting of this Executive Board is going to be held uh, tomorrow on 11th of January. Now, when the Pakistani authorities and the International Monetary Fund reached that staff level agreement, the IMF had to say, let me quote that, that the agreement supports the authorities' commitment to advance the planned fiscal consolidation, accelerate cost-reducing reforms in the energy sector, complete the return to a market-determined exchange rate, and pursue state-owned enterprises and governance reforms to attract investment and support job creation while continuing to strengthen social assistance, unquote. Now, as we all know, especially in the wake of the devastating floods back in 2022, uh, country's economy was faced with many challenges and difficulties. And in this regard, the Pakistani authorities are doing their utmost in order to stabilize this economy. And uh, one of those steps was also reaching this standby arrangement of $3 billion uh, for a time period of nine months with the International Monetary Fund that necessarily avoided a default uh, for Pakistan at that particular cri uh, critical juncture. Also, a number of very tough measures based on the conditions uh, of that particular agreement Pakistani authorities reached with the International Monetary Fund. Pakistani authorities had to navigate a very, very narrow corridor in order to meet those uh, tough conditions. But later on, we saw uh, there were positive results uh, coming out uh, as a result of those uh, tough measures taken by the government. Uh, we've also seen Pakistan's stock exchange performing remarkably, especially in, at the end of the last year. Uh, also, uh, there was a cumulative appreciation of the value of the Pakistani rupee against the dollar also because of the efforts put in by the authorities. We'll be talking about the likelihood, uh, what are the expectations, uh, especially when the executive board sits to approve this particular uh, release or the disbursement of the $700 million tranche uh, after the first review. And also upon the completion of this particular ongoing standby arrangement, uh, is there any requirement or is there any likelihood of a new IMF program that Pakistan would be entering with the International Monetary Fund? We'll also be uh, discussing the prospects of that possibility also. Also, a major development has taken place. Uh, Caretaker Minister for IT and Telecom, Dr. Omar Saif, has launched the first ever Pakistan startup uh, fund worth 2 billion rupees to attract the venture investment and position local startups on the global stage. We'll also be discussing in today's show as to what the potential and the prospects the IT sector in particular has got in order to attract the foreign investment as well as enhance the country's exports. Uh, for uh, discussing all these aspects, we are honored to have been joined in the studio by Dr. Shujat Farooq. He's Chief of Research at Pakistan Institute of uh, Development Economics. Uh, Dr. Farooq, thank you very much thank for your you. time, thank for being you. with us on the show tonight. Really appreciate that. Also in the studio, we are honored to have been joined by Dr. Manzoor Ahmed. He is Member Task Force on Tax Reforms and also former Ambassador to the World Trade Organization. Dr. Ahmed, thank you very much for your time also for being with us on the show tonight. Really appreciate that. On Skype at the same time, we are honored to have been joined by Dr. Khakan Najib, his former advisor at the Ministry of Finance. Dr. Najib, thank you very much for your time once again for being with us on Views on News tonight. We really appreciate that. If both of you gentlemen allow me, let me discuss, uh, begin the discussion with Dr. Khakan Najib. Dr. Najib, now uh, tomorrow the IMF Executive Board is going to decide how likely, how how much likely is the approval or go ahead by the executive board of the release and disbursement of this particular tranche and how crucial at this particular point in time uh, is this particular approval what are your expectations uh, please go ahead 
Javad, you've put it very well. When Pakistan was not in the program, um, and you know, the ninth review of the last program, the 22nd program, was not getting completed. Pakistan's reserves went down almost to 2.9 billion on 20th of June 2023. You know, there was talk of default. The markets were pricing um, the, the Pakistan bond at almost half the value they are doing so currently. Um, our ratings had dropped. So, you know, it was a very uncomfortable situation for Pakistan. Pakistan went into an SBA. This is a nine-month facility. This is not a program per se, as the extended fund facility is for about three years. So Pakistan went into a 23rd facility, which is called the standby arrangement, to ensure that Pakistan bridges the nine-month gap, which comes from moving from the last government to the new government. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that the first review went smoothly. The quantitative performance criteria, the indicative targets, as well as the quanti continuous performance criteria, all were fulfilled. The structural benchmarks were also fulfilled. Um, we have to remember that this was extremely important. The first six months, the inflows, even from the multilaterals, have been on the slower side in Pakistan. Right now, Pakistan's needs, considering that the current account has shrunk, are still about $25 billion. Out of that, we have 11 to $12 billion, which are rollovers. I think a billion still remains there. And the rest of the 11 to $12 billion, we have to find new in terms of multilaterals, bilaterals, commercial loans. And we're still, I think, short on about five, $6 billion. So it's extremely important for Pakistan to have secured the first tranche, which is in the SBA, fulfill all the targets. One and all the benchmarks are met, usually the board goes through. Uh, just to share with you, because I've run Pakistan's you know, first program, and then even when we signed the second one, I was there. The board then sent some questions to the government of um, uh, the country. Uh, they answer them, and usually um, they try and make sure that the board's comfortable. I'm sure the Pakistan government has done so, and we will be able to sail through quite comfortably, and the 700 million would flow in. But for me, of well, course, the 700 million are less about important. Dr. Najib, I seek your pardon for the interjection. Quickly, if I understand, you seem very positive that it is highly likely that this approval is going to take place, and Pakistan is going to get the disbursement of that 700 million dollars. Let me proceed to Dr. Farooq. Dr. Farooq, what are your expectations? Um, uh, and uh, if you're positive, as Dr. Khaka Najib is, uh, what factors do you think actually led to uh, uh, Pakistan achieving this particular thing and making the executive board uh, approve this one? If it happens tomorrow, what were those crucial steps the Pakistani authorities had to take um, in order to uh, steer the country's economy on the right track and also navigate through those tough conditions being set by IMF earlier? Uh, uh, Joseph, I think uh, uh, this uh, standby agreement, you know, that was signed in July and uh, it was for nine months, as uh, Hakan Saab said. Uh, uh, there were, you know, that there were four main points. And I think uh, if you look the staff level agreement that has already been done in November, and uh, tomorrow uh, there is executive board meeting. I am pretty sure because we have met all these targets. For example, first, uh, you know that we formulated the budget 2024 in consultation with IMF. And you know that in this budget, uh, we have made certain commitment that there should be not too much deviation. Uh, and we will ensure debt sustainability. We will protect certain, you know, that uh, crit criti critical social spending, and we are doing that. Uh, so, so that's pretty sure that we have made uh, these four commitments. Second, you know that uh, there was certain commitment on market-based exchange rate, and you can see previously there was too much deviation between uh, <coughs> market rate as uh, and the government rate. And you can see that over the last two months, uh, there is no almost deviation. The rate is almost the same. And third, you can see uh, uh, the government's commitment over uh, state bank commitment over fiscal pol uh, monetary policy. Uh, we are following the tight monetary policy to disinflation, and we are following that. So, so I am pretty sure that uh, we have uh, given all the indication uh, that was committed, and uh, I am pretty sure that uh, we have the done all this. The person is going to get this yeah, disbursement. Yeah. Right. So, so we will get this. Uh, right, uh, Dr. Ahmed, what's your understanding? How positive are you regarding? Uh, this particular disbursement of the well, trash. I, I mean, I fully share the views of uh, Dr. Khakar Najib and Dr. Shujaat. Um, you know, it, it, uh, once we have the previous uh, staff level agreement, I think 
this would surely uh, come about. And uh, as Dr. Shiraz was just saying, I mean, there were these three or four key things. Uh, one, exchange rate, and uh, we are there on, on target. The other was uh, bringing energy prices to a more sustainable level. I mean, <coughs> they didn't want any subsidies, and, and the prices have been raised to that of international level. So, so that's all right. And uh, I think the third was um, revenue mobilization, and we are uh, we have met the IMF targets and doing very well. And this year, the number of uh, filers has increased uh, almost threefold. I think it's the highest ever. And uh, then there was the SO uh, state enterprises. And I think this morning's newspaper, there was some good news about uh, PIA, you know, the, the way, the, the, the progress they've made. And so I think on almost everything, we, are, we have met the targets. And, and, uh, and, and this is also evident from other indicators, like you see our international bond prices, which were really nowhere. And now they've, they've shot up in our uh, uh, stock exchange and all these other indicators. So I think I'm, I'm quite positive. Uh, right, uh, Dr. Hakan Najib, now once we get these $700 million after the executive board's approval tomorrow, uh, how is it going to affect the overall outlook of the economy in the immediate term? Or what sort of immediate impacts on what things exactly it's going to have? So, Jawad, we keep going back to the IMF because we have a balance of payments challenge. Uh, the 23rd program that we are going through is also uh, because of a balance of payments challenge. So once we get these 700 million, what I expect is for AIIB, for World Bank, and the Asian Development Bank to be dispersing higher in the next six months than they did in the past six months. Now, this is extremely important because if you don't get these disbursements, then you are borrowing from the local banks. Pakistan's borrowing over the last six months from the local banks has been heavy because, of course, our deficits are on the heavier side. Um, if we were to be able to get support from um, the World Bank and the other multilaterals, then our borrowing on the domestic would um, uh, calm down. And, and I think that's extremely important for the government to move. Then secondly, of course, um, you know, all the other bilateral partners also look towards IMF, doctor of the last resort, to ensure that Pakistan stays the reform path on the state bank, um, you know, um, uh, monetary policy, as well as the exchange rate management. These are the two important things. Um, on the fiscal, we stay on a consolidation path where we uh, not only control our expenditures, but also ensure that, as Dr. Manzoor was rightly saying, that our tax revenues um, get enhanced. Um, on the, you know, on the energy side, I think there are more pricing changes. I'm never happy with um, um, uh, what happens there. We've done pricing changes. Our circular debt still keeps going up. Our issues are much deeper in nature. But let me say this. That's not for the IMF to do. IMF is there to ensure that your liquidity position, wherever um, you're stuck, gets comfortable. And that's exactly what they're doing. So energy, yes, we will pass through, but that doesn't mean it solves our energy issues um, to a, any um, a comfortable level. Um, so we have this. We ensure that the next six months, the targets of um, enhancing our state bank reserves, which now stand at about $7.7 .7 billion, as I talked to you, are further enhanced, and we end up somewhere between, my estimate is eight and a half to $9 billion if all the fund flows come through, um, and let's hope that they do. Also remember that on 30th of December, all the other targets for the second review will become um, very important for us. So let's uh, see the numbers when they come out on the fiscal, the monetary, the energy um, side. These are the three major areas where Pakistan's program is run, um, what the numbers are. Um, and hopefully we will also look forward to a successful second review. And then, of course, I mean, uh, there is the, uh, you know, as I say, there are three most important transitions Pakistan is about to make in the next three months. Number one on February 8th, where we transition into a political government. Number two, a transition of the SBA, which is the current standby arrangement into a new extended fund facility for the next three years. It's important, it's crucial for Pakistan not to delay this facility. And the third is the transition of the budget, which also must be very reform oriented, both on the taxation side, but more so on the expenditure side. If Pakistan is able to make these three 
important transition smoothly, timely, then Pakistan will see that the macro stability uh, that has been created today will further as we move along in the next six months. Uh, right, Dr. Farooq, what immediate impact after this disbursement of $700 million Pakistan would be having on its economy? What factors do you think are going to be impacted the most? Uh, I think uh, <coughs> uh, the caretaker government uh, has achieved the minimum agenda. Uh, uh, we have taken certain internal as well as external measures and uh, we can see the impact. For example, you know that this year we have the target that uh, primary surplus of, uh, you know, that that should be... Uh, 0.4% uh, of GDP and earlier we always face this deficit. Same as uh, Khan Saab uh, mentioned that you know that sir, uh, combined circular debt in you know that in oil and gas uh, that is a big issue. Uh, right now we are facing 4% of GDP and we have started to take certain measures like for example we have increased the gas prices and uh, we have certain commitment that uh, uh, we also protect the vulnerable population but also you know that uh, let's move toward the market but reforms. Right, uh, uh, so, so once you talk about uh, this uh, this particular pricing yeah. changes when it comes to gas sector right um, uh, dr khakan was uh, already of the view that he's not uh, particularly happy with uh, that particular mechanism because the problems continue to exist. Uh, Dr. Khakan, I'll come back to you to take your understanding uh, where to actually start from to actually reform this particular sector if you're not happy uh, with that mechanism <coughs> of uh, pricing changes. Uh, Dr. Farooq, now uh, what's your understanding? Are you happy with this mechanism when we talk about specifically pricing changes when it comes to uh, reforming the energy sector in particular? Uh, uh, you know that uh, uh, you have to take certain reforms. For example, there could be certain reforms. For example, let's move toward the price competitiveness. You know that, uh, and we have done that. But on the other hand, yes, I totally agree with Dr. Hakan that we require certain structural reforms. For example, you know that uh, uh, we have discos, and you know that, for example, uh, look at uh, power sector. For example, previous year we have around nine. Uh, 70 billion subsidies in the power sector and the WAPDA losses are around five, uh, 550 billion. So, so uh, uh, you know that uh, first we have to move toward targeted subsidies. For example, rather than giving uh, uniform subsidy to all the industry, we have to focus these uh, subsidies toward export sector. Second, you know that don't give subsidy to everyone, just make it targeted. Si similarly, you know that we have discos, uh, and these discos must, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, that require certain autonomy. For example, you can see that uh, uh, GAPCO, ISCO, FESCO, uh, and LESCO, they are quite good, uh, you know, that uh, in revenue generation, but when you go toward Balochistan and, uh, you know, that KP, we need, uh, you know, that certain reforms. And I think government have started that. For example, you can see that uh, in KP, Mardan was the, uh, you know, that there was huge theft in electricity, but now it, it has been declared right. as the model district. So there are certain commitment that we need certain reforms, but yes, absolutely, uh, still, you know, that uh, we require certain reforms on transmission, on distribution, as well as on generation. So, 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 so that is deep-rooted. Uh, uh, right. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, what uh, sort of an impact this disbursement is going to have uh, immediately? Well, I mean, one, one thing is that had it not come, we would have, again, the same problem that we had in the first six months of uh, uh, last year. So this, will, this disbursement will ensure smooth passage over the next uh, few months. <coughs> Although I must say that there are a few um, international factors. Uh, uh, domestic first, uh, as uh, Dr. Hakan was saying, uh, first is the big one is the elections. I hope that goes smoothly and the uh, transition is smooth. But the next one will be the our uh, getting the next uh, IMF uh, loan. That would be another thing because we desperately need that one. And the third, I think, will be if the international situation, like for example, I, uh, uh, one example, pet petroleum prices last June, uh, June 20, 22, I think, they were somewhere like $120. And now they are about $71, $72. So I hope that they stay at the same level because almost 30% of our imports consists of uh, petroleum products. And if the prices go up too much, that disturbs everything. That d disturbs our, uh, you know, CAD, and that disturbs our inflation, everything. So these three or four factors, if, if uh, they stay on the normal course as uh, expected, 
uh, I think we'll be okay. The global oil prices, you mean to say, if they go up, it affects a lot of things over here in the country's economy, right? Yeah. Okay, so let me take this point to Dr. Khakan. Dr. Khakan, what's your understanding? How to address this particular challenge? So, Jawad, I mean, the exogenous factors, the factors which are, you know, coming from the outside, of course, are um, in terms of the energy pricing, the commodity pricing, and then how the world economy is going to do. Uh, you know, I do a lot of work internationally, and I think the world economies are looking decent. Um, the employment figures across U.S., Australia are looking decent. Um, these economies are not going to have a hard landing. They are going to avoid um, a recessionary landing. Um, and they're going to do well. So the economies are going to um, start having, um, May would be my best bet where the uh, interest rates start to drop both in Australasia as well as the US. Slightly, I think, behind the curve, inflation has started to uh, slow down. So that's going to be better for Pakistan because it will help our exports. So I think the international scenario in 2024 is going to look easier than it looked in 2023. It's going to be a tailwind on the export set. But our own issues, um, you know, where right, we so all... So of us I seek your pardon for the interjection. That pricing uh, changes. Uh, you already mentioned you're not happy with this sort of a mechanism. Of course, there are deep-rooted challenges that need to be addressed when it comes to energy sector in particular. Uh, where to start from? So, and, you know, one thing you have to now see is that you have three doctors, I mean, doctors of Pakistan economy, and they are telling you that uh, the Pakistan economy on the energy side needs a, a very disruptive behavior. You know, structural reforms, uh, uh, we use disruptive behavior you know, to limit the state's role. So you have to be clear on the mindset that we are unable to run the discos and the generation companies. I think that's the starting point. So you need a, a state which has a minor role and a light touch regulation. So that's the framework that you have to think about. Then you have to start thinking about how to solve this IPP issue. You know, uh, I, I, I will go into detail so that people understand that it is not a solutionless issue. The, the solutions are there and just point a couple of things. For example, the IPP debt is held for 10 years by Pakistan. It should be held for 25 years. Let's say if we were to start negotiating such a thing, the cost of generation would come down. On the tariff side, we, we really need to redesign this tariff. The tariff is skewed. It is heavier on the industry. So we need to redesign it. The subsidies, we need to kind of totally move away from the 500 billion that doctor mentioned um, just now. We have to start moving to the income support in terms of the subsidies, let the cost of service be recovered. Um, similarly, you know, uh, if you can't um, uh, run them, then you have to privatize them. You know, this notion of provincialization, provinces are not going to be able to ever run something that the federal government can't run. So, you know, you have to be very, very clear. Even on the concessions agreement, I'm, I'm not too sure. I think you have to move towards a very, very clear, um, 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 uh, you know, demarcation where you are clear that you need to offload these, not only the discos, but especially the Jencos, the Nandipur, uh, the coal power plants. You, you, you have to make sure that you get a then you have to create a much better regulator. You know, our regulators are stuck with the point that they need to do tariff. No, they need to create a market in Pakistan. I, I know there's a lot of work that we've done over the last few years on creating a market for um, the, um, but you have to remember, we are in an energy emergency in Pakistan. IMF or World Bank are not going to come and cure. They have, the World Bank has, you know, starting from the area electric board, they have brought us here. Use your local doctors who understand the energy sector and the solutions are quite clear. Thar coal is your own coal. Move on to it. Now, many people would tell you that, yeah, these are solutions we are moving. The problem is the pace at which you are moving and the pace at which you are bleeding is not commensurate. Your pace of uh, right, movement right, is 10 right, kilometers right, an hour. Once again, I seek your pardon. When you speak of thar coal, uh, uh, there are um, also uh, certain opinions as to the grade of that particular coal, perhaps. It is viable to be used in that particular 
uh, line uh, whether it has got that particular grading uh, to get that electric electricity from uh, what's your understanding about that my understanding is that I've seen CMEC is the company which um, is, I think, SIN and the private company put together. They've done very good work. Some of the power plant has have initially been taken on THAR. The others could be taken um, um, as well. That is Pakistan's future. We slowed down because of environmental concerns. I don't think we should. Um, the, so the push there and then you know you the uh, the new hybrid wind the solar ipps you know they should be accounting for anywhere 10 to 20 thousand in the next five to ten years in pakistan so that's indigenous again um so you you have to find this cheap clean financing products uh, and they are available um, in the world and you know the, the the future is mining of the critical raw materials in pakistan the nature-based carbon offsets the e-buses the e-rickshaws that is the mindset that Pakistan must move. Why do I say right. that? Let's say if you are going to do that, your import currently is 25 to 30 percent energy. Your bill would drop on the import side, so your current account would be helped, your indigenous would pick up. But these solutions where they may be obvious to us and we may be able to put to you, implementing them to a local competitive team is something very different. I really, with all due respect, say this, our government stays stuck in the operational matters so much that this kind of policy framework or the kind of brainstorming we are doing, the three of us are doing in front of you, really, really, you know, it uh, doesn't happen. And then, you know, building the regulator up. I think this is then moving, you know, what, what happens in winter? I, I, always say this your demands probably drop to 8 to 10000 megawatts your capacity is at 40000 megawatts you need to you know move away and move to maximize electrification of cooking heating and transportation okay. now let's say you you know again you, the pace at which you need to do all those things is so phenomenal so that you get out of this building of 500 to 1000 billion rupee loss that you would do this year. Right. The IMF okay, program is $3 billion. Very, very important and pertinent points mentioned by you, Dr. Haq and Ajib. Dr. Farooq, do you want to add something to this particular, the kind of uh, challenges that we've got in the energy sector? Yeah. Uh, first, you know that I feel that energy is even bigger than economy. And if you look uh, uh, in PIDE, we have made an exercise that over the last 20 years, we have made more than 20 2 trillion losses in energy sector. Uh, 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 in 2020, uh, we uh, just used the, uh, on private sector, we use uh, hardly, I think, 50 percent energy was produced, but we pay capacity charges. So, you know that uh, these are long, you know that uh, certain challenges in the agreements that we made in uh, late 90s. The question is that why we need a power ministry. You know that power ministry is basically, you know, that that is the custodian who have to uh, uh, formulate policies. But look at the principal accounting officer, secretary, the average duration in power ministry, that is just seven, eight months. So, so first, I think we don't require the power ministry. Let's run this, uh, you know, that energy sector on the basis of totally market basis and commercialization basis. Let's uh, make the uh, a competition among the discos, genco's, and distribution. So, so I think uh, these are uh, the major. And uh, uh, second is the renewable energy. Like for example, you can see that right now people are investing on solar. They are, uh, you know, that they are producing. So this, this sort of, you know, how, that how viable is uh, using coal? As Dr. Khagan Ajib has said, uh, because is also the view that uh, we perhaps slowed down the pace because of the environmental concerns. What's your understanding? Uh, 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 you know that uh, I have interacted with the uh, uh, coal authority. They have the view that we can modify our uh, plants and uh, you know that there are certain grading issues of the thar coal coal, but we can modify these plants and uh, we can run these plants, but, uh, but you know that re you require certain, you know, that technology addition, uh, certain modification, and you can use the indigenous resources to run that. Uh, right, uh, Dr. Ahmed, your understanding of how to overcome the challenges associated with this energy sector, a number of recommendations have been made by Dr. Haga and Najib as well as Dr. Farooq. Uh, well, I mean, uh, you see, we have recently developed the third call and we were uh, doing well relatively fast, but more recently, all the developed countries are coming up with these new restrictions on exports from developing countries using uh, using such fuels which have high carbon emissions. 
So, uh, I mean, it's, it's not yet uh, levied on Pakistan. It's, it's on some products. The like carbon taxation? Uh, yeah, oh. carbon taxation. And, and for the time being, it's uh, on, uh, say, uh, cement and, and, and uh, steel, et cetera, such, uh, you know, which are uh, huge consumers of energy. But I think from 2027, 20, or maybe in the next two, three years, they'll be, they'll be taking other uh, products, like even textile. Itself. So we have to be careful. But we, we are, uh, unfortunately, we have two uh, very good alternate resources. One is uh, the, the solar, which uh, Dr. Shia just mentioned. Um, and the prices have really come down this year. So the government needs to encourage it even more so that uh, you know, we have this abundant resource. And, and the other is hydroelectric. We have so much hydroelectric that we don't really need anything else. So these two areas have to be pushed to get us out of our uh, energy problems. Uh, right, uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed, your point is well taken. Unfortunately, we're short of time. There is another very important development. Um, as already mentioned, there is the launch of the Pakistan Startup Fund worth 2 billion rupees. Now, uh, how do you look at this particular step? Uh, and uh, also talking about the potential, uh, one of the key sectors in the Special Investment Facilitation Council happens to be IT. We saw incentives also in the last year's budget regarding the IT sector. Uh, how do you think this particular step is actually going to give an impetus in order to attract the investment in IT sector in Pakistan, ultimately enhancing the exports also? Dr. Ahmed, please go ahead. Uh, me? Okay. Uh, one, I think these, these new measures that have been taken are in consultations with the IT, you know, exporters, et cetera. And I think to a large extent, their, um, their problems have been addressed. But there are, uh, you know, the, 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 the spectrum is much less and, and, and there are these other problems which the government has to do. But I think uh, more recently, they have been taking every step to address that. And you know, they have a target from the getting from two, 2.5 billion to about 10 billion. That's a huge challenge, but they're doing everything, I think, what, what, what could Annually, be Annually, uh, to yes. uh, the exports, the volume yes, of the yes, exports. exports to uh, from 2.5 billion, they're currently standard this particular figure, and uh, the target is to reach up to 10 billion. 10 dollars. billion, yeah. Right, uh, Dr. Farooq, now the potential and the prospects related to the IT sector, one of the key sectors <coughs> under the Special Investment Facilitation Council also. Yeah, I think uh, IT is everywhere. Uh, if you look, um, SIFC, we have to improve our agriculture, we have to improve industry, and especially you know that, that uh, we have to improve services and export sector. So IT is everywhere. Uh, you know that uh, look and uh, look at Indian export uh, right now. They are more than 160 billion dollar per annum, and that is even more than the oil export of Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and uh, Kuwait. So, so we are missing so how this. How much year. potential has Pakistan got? So, so, so we have huge potential. You know that uh, IT. You know Can that. Can we cross it, that 160 billion dollars? Uh, uh, you know that uh, they started. Uh, you know that it depends on your policy. They started uh, this journey. I think in well, there early, were a lot of early incentives 90s. during this yeah. year's budget also. Yeah. yeah. So, a fixed so tax rate also. Yeah. So, so there are certain reforms. For example, you can see that uh, the, uh, the government have facilitated the freelancers that now. Uh, they can receive the money through PayPal, you know that uh, PayPal is uh, a big uh, uh, through which you know that freelancing etc. So, so uh, but you know that uh, we have to focus more for example on IT uh, building IT parks on startups and I think uh, let's And this particular initiative the, uh, the Pakistan startup yeah, fund yeah how yeah. do you look at uh, that uh, 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 i think that's a good initiative that's a good initiative because you know that uh, right now in our universities you know that uh, uh, we have graduates but uh, they lack the facility of startups they lack the facility of entrepreneurship uh, so most of them they are looking the job so definitely uh, this step will give them certain you know that financial ease uh, point well yeah. taken dr shujat farooq chief of research at pakistan institute of development economics thank you very much for taking time out for views on news tonight we really appreciate that dr manzoor ahmed member task force on tax reforms and former ambassador to the world trade organization uh, dr manzoor ahmed thank you very much for your time also for being with us on the show tonight we really appreciate that on sky we were joined by dr khaka najid former advisor ministry of finance Dr. Najib, thank you very much for your time also for being with us on the show tonight. Really appreciate that. With that, we come to the end of today's episode. Till the next one, take good care of yourselves.